Chapter 8 The Demonstration Late that afternoon, Guido and Beppo turned up. They found Momo sitting in the shade of a wall, still rather pale and upset, so they sat down beside her and anxiously inquired what the matter was. Momo began to tell them what had happened, haltingly at first, but she ended by repeating her entire conversation with the man in grey, word for word. Old Beppo watched her gravely and intently throughout, the furrows in his wrinkled brow growing deeper by the minute. He said nothing, even when she had finished. Guido, by contrast, listened to her with mounting excitement. His eyes began to shine, as they so often did when he himself was telling a story and got carried away. He gripped Momo by the shoulder. Well, he said, this is our big moment. You've discovered something no one else knew. Now we can rescue everyone from their clutches. Not just our friends, but the whole city. It's up to the three of us, you, me and Beppo. He jumped up and stood there with his arms flung out. In his mind's eye he could see a vast crowd of people hailing him as the savior. Yes, said Momo, looking rather baffled, but how? What do you mean, how? Guido demanded irritably. I mean, said Momo, how do we beat the men in grey at their own game? Guido shrugged. I can't say exactly, of course, not right this minute. We'll have to work something out first, but one thing's for sure. Now we know they exist and what they're up to. We must tackle them. Or are you scared? Momo nodded uneasily. I don't think they're ordinary men. The one that was here looked different somehow, and the air around him was dreadfully cold. If there are a lot of them, they're bound to be dangerous. Yes, I'm scared. Don't be silly, Guido said briskly. The whole thing's quite simple. They can only do their dirty work as long as nobody recognizes them. Your visitor said so himself. Well then, all we have to do is make sure they're recognizable. Once people recognize them, they remember them. And once they remember them, they'll know them again at a glance. The man in grey won't be able to harm us then. We'll be safe as houses. You really think so? Momo said rather doubtfully. Guido's eyes were shining with confidence. Of course, he assured her. Why else would your visitor have taken to his heels like that? They're terrified of us, I tell you. What if we can't find them? Momo asked. They may go and hide. They may well, Guido conceded. If they do, we'll simply have to lure them out into the open. But how? asked Momo. They're pretty clever, it seems to me. That's easy, Guido said with a chuckle. We'll take advantage of their own greed. If you can catch mice with cheese, you can catch time thieves with time. And that's what we've got plenty of. For instance, Beppo and I could lie in and wait while you sat here twiddling your thumbs. When they took the bait, we jump out and overpower them. But they already know me, Momo objected. I don't think they'd fall for it. All right, said Guido, who was brimming over with bright ideas. Then we'll try something else. Your man in grey mentioned something about a time-saving bank. That means it's a building somewhere in town. All we have to do is find it. And find it we will, because it's bound to be a very special-looking place. I can see it now, grey, sinister and windowless, like a gigantic concrete safe. Once we find it, we'll walk straight in. We'll all be armed with pistols, one in each hand. You, I'll say, hand over the time you've stolen and make it snappy, and they'll... But we don't have any pistols, Momo broke in anxiously. Guido grandly dismissed this objection. 
Then we'll do it unarmed. That'll impress them even more. They'll panic at the very sight of us. It might be better if there were a few more of us, Momo said. I mean, we'd probably find the time-saving bank quicker if other people went looking for it as well. That's a good idea, said Guido. We must mobilize all our friends and all the kids who spend so much time here nowadays. I vote we get started right away, the three of us. Tell as many people as you can find and tell them to pass the word. We'll all meet up here at three tomorrow afternoon for a grand council of war. So they all set off at once. Momo in one direction, Beppo and Guido in another. The two men had gone some distance when Beppo, who still hadn't spoken, came to a sudden stop. Know something, Guido? he said. I am worried. Guido turned to look at him. About what? Beppo regarded his friend in silence for a moment. Then he said, I believe Momo. So do I, said Guido puzzled. What of it? I mean, Beppo went on, I believe that what she told us is true. Guido couldn't understand what the old man was getting at. Of course, he said. So what? Well, said Beppo, if it is true what she told us, we shouldn't rush into anything. We don't want to tangle with a bunch of crooks just like that, do we? If we provoke them. It may land Momo in trouble. I don't mind so much about us, but we may endanger the children if we bring them into it too. We must think very carefully before we act. Guido threw back his head and laughed. <laughs> you and your eternal worrying, he scoffed. The more of us there are, the better. That's obvious. From the sound of it, Beppo said gravely, you don't believe that Momo's story was true at all. Depends what you mean by true, Guido retorted. You have no imagination, that's your trouble. The whole world's one big story and we are all part of it. Sure, I believe what Momo told us, Beppo, every word of it, just like you. Beppo could not find a suitable response to this, but Guido's optimism did nothing to allay his fears. They then parted company, Guido with a light heart, Beppo filled with foreboding, and went off to spread the news of tomorrow's meeting. That night, Guido dreamed he was being feted as one of the city's saviors. He saw himself in a dress suit, Beppo in a smart tailcoat and Momo in a snow-white silk gown. The mayor draped gold chains around their necks, and crowned them with laurel wreaths. Stirring music rang out, and the citizens honored their deliverers with a torchlight procession longer and more impressive than any that had ever been seen before. Meanwhile, Old Paper was tossing and turning, unable to sleep. The more he thought about what lay ahead, the more clearly he perceived its dangers. He wouldn't let Guido and Momo brave them alone. He would stand by them whatever happened, that went without saying, but he must at least attempt to dissuade them. By three the next afternoon the amphitheater resounded to excited cries and the hum of many voices. Although it saddened Momo that none of her grown-up friends had appeared, except of course for Beppo and Guido, some fifty or sixty children had come from near and far. They were all shapes and sizes, rich and poor, well-behaved and rowdy. Some, like Maria, were holding younger members of the family by the hand or in their arms. Tiny little children who sucked their thumbs and gazed wide-eyed at the unusual gathering. Franco, Paolo and Massimo were there too, naturally, but most of the other children were relative newcomers to the amphitheater, and they had a special interest in the subject under discussion. Among them was the owner of the transistor radio, who had turned up without it. Seating himself next to Momo, he told her straight away that his name was Claudio, 
and that he was glad to have been invited. When it became clear that the last of the children had arrived, Guido rose to his feet and with a sweeping gesture called for silence. The buzz of conversation died away, and an expectant hush descended on the amphitheatre. My friends, Guido began, you all have a rough idea why we're here. You were told when you received your invitations to the secret meeting. More and more people are finding themselves with less and less time to spare, even though they're saving it for all they are worth. The truth is, they've lost the very time they meant to save. Why? We know now, thanks to Momo. People are being robbed of their time, and I mean robbed by a gang of time thieves. That's why we need your help. So, as to put a stop to the activities of this cold-blooded criminal fraternity. Our city is in the grip of a nightmare. With your cooperation, we can banish it at a stroke. Isn't that a cause worth fighting for? He paused while the children applauded. We will discuss what to do in due course, he went on. Meantime, Momo is going to describe her encounter with a member of the gang and how he gave himself away. One moment, said Beppo, getting up. Listen, children, I say Momo shouldn't tell you her story. It's a bad idea. If she does, she'll endanger herself and all of you. No, cried several voices. Let her speak. We want Momo. More and more voices joined in until all the children were chanting Mo 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 in unison. Old Beppo sat down again. He took off his little steel rimmed spectacles and wearily rubbed his eyes. Momo stood up, looking perplexed. She didn't know whose wishes to comply with Beppo's or the children's. At length, while her audience listened attentively, she recounted what had happened. A long silence fell when she finished. The children had grown rather uneasy during her speech. They hadn't imagined that time thieves could be so sinister. One tiny tot burst into tears, but was quickly comforted. The silence was broken by Guido. Well, he said, how many of you have the guts to join our campaign against the man in grey? Why didn't Beppo want Momo to tell us what happened? Franco inquired. Guido gave him a reassuring smile. He thinks the time thieves feel threatened by those who know their secret, so they try to hunt them down. Myself, I think, it's the other way around. I'm convinced that knowing their secret makes a person invulnerable. Once you know it, they can't lay a finger on you. That's logical, wouldn't you say? Come on, Beppo, admit it. But Beppo only shook his head, and the children remained silent. One thing is certain, anyway, Guido pursued. From now on, we must stick together, come hell or high water. We've got to be careful, but we mustn't get scared. All right, I'll ask you again. Who's prepared to join us? I am, said Claudio, getting to his feet. He looked a trifle pale. Others followed suit, hesitantly at first, then more and more resolutely, until everyone present had volunteered. Well, Beppo, said Guido, pointing to the forest of raised hands, what do you say now? Beppo nodded sadly. I'm with you too, of course. Good, Guido turned back to the children. So now let's decide what to do. Any suggestions? They all thought hard. Paolo, the boy with glasses, finally said, But how do they do it? I mean, can they really steal time? Yes, what is time anyway? Claudio chimed in. No one could supply an answer. Maria, with little Rosa in her arms, 
got up from her seat on the far side of the arena. Maybe it's like electricity, she hazarded. After all, there are machines that can record people's thought waves. I've seen one myself on TV. They've got gadgets that can do anything these days. How about this for an idea, squeaked Massimo, the fat boy with the high-pitched voice. When you photograph something, it's down on film. When you record something, it's down on tape. Maybe they've got a machine that can record time. If we knew where it was, we could simply put it into reverse and the missing time would be there again. Anyway, said Paolo, adjusting his glasses, the first thing to do is find a scientist to help us. We won't get anywhere without one. You and your scientists, sneered Franco. Who says they can be trusted? Suppose we find one who was an expert on time. How could we be sure he wasn't in league with the time thieves? Then we'd really be up the creek. Everyone seemed impressed by this objection. The next person to speak up was a little girl of demure and ladylike appearance. If you ask me, she said, our best plan would be to go to the police and tell them the whole story. Now I've heard everything, Franco scoffed. What would the policemen do? These aren't just ordinary thieves. Either the cops have known about them all along, in which case they must be powerless, or they haven't noticed a thing, in which case they'd never believe us. A baffled silence ensued. Well, Paolo said eventually, we've got to do something, as soon as possible too, before the time thieves get wind of what we are up to. Guido rose to his feet again. My friends, he said, I've already given this matter a lot of thought. After dreaming up hundreds of schemes and rejecting them all in turn, I finally hit one that's guaranteed to do the trick, as long as you all cooperate. I merely wanted to see if one of you could come up with a better idea. Well, now I tell you what we're going to do. He paused and looked slowly around the amphitheater. He was ringed by fifty or sixty expectant faces, the biggest audience he had in a long time. As you are now aware, he went on, the men in grey depend for their power on being able to work unrecognized and in secret. It follows that the simplest and most effective way of rendering them harmless is to broadcast the truth about them. And how are we to do that? I'll tell you. We are going to hold a mass demonstration. We are going to paint posters and banners and march through the streets with them. We are going to attract as much attention as possible. We are going to invite the whole city to join us here at the old amphitheater to hear the full facts. A stir ran through the listening children. Everyone will go wild with excitement, Guido continued. Thousands and thousands of people will come flocking in. Then, when a vast crowd has assembled, we'll reveal the whole terrible truth. And then, my friends, the world will change overnight. No one will be able to steal people's time any more. They all have as much as they need, because there will be enough to go around again. That's what we can achieve if we all work together, if we're all in favor. Are we? This drew a chorus of exultant yells. Carried unanimously, said Guido. In that case, we'll invite the whole city here next Sunday afternoon. Till then, though, we mustn't breathe a word of our plan. And now, let's get to work. For the next few days, the amphitheater hummed with furative but feverish activity. Sheets of paper, pots of paint, brushes, paste, cardboards, poles, planks and a host of other essentials appeared like magic. 
where from, the children preferred not to say. Some of them made banners and posters and placards, while others, the ones that were good at writing, thought up catchy slogans and painted them in their neatest lettering. At last, when all was ready, the children assembled in the amphitheater and set off in a single file with Guido, Beppo and Momo at their head. They marched through the streets, brandishing posters and banners, clattering saucepan lids, blowing penny whistles, chanting slogans and singing a song composed especially for the occasion by Guido. The words went as follows. Listen, folk, here is it too late, all you'll live to rue your fate. Time is flying every day, stolen by the man in grey. Listen, folk, and heed our warning, all you wake up one fine morning, robbed of time and quite bereft, another single minute left. Don't save time, then save your city, for those time thieves have no pity. Fight back hard and do it soon. Be there Sunday afternoon. Actually, there were more verses than that, 28 to be exact, but we needn't quote them all here. Although the police stepped in a few times and broke up the procession when it obstructed the traffic, the children were undeterred. They simply formed up elsewhere and set off again. Nothing happened apart from this, and they didn't scythe a single man in grey for all their vigilians. They were, however, joined by other children who saw the demonstration and hadn't known of the affair until now. More and more youngsters tagged along until the streets were filled with hundreds or even thousands of them, all urging their elders to attend the meeting that was to change the world.